Hmm. I can't make any more videos, especially about test equipment, until I tell you guys about cardiac output. In other words, how would you know what you're even looking at? We're going to do that right now. Coming up next, right here on Better Biomed. Folks, welcome back to Better Biomed. I just realized that I have yet to cover cardiac output, and until I do, I cannot go further down the patient simulation rabbit hole. So, for starters, what's cardiac output? Well, cardiac output, or CO, is the amount of blood in liters pumped by the heart in one minute. Cardiac output is the stroke volume times the heart rate. Now, the stroke volume is the milliliters of blood pumped per beat of the ventricles, and the heart rate is the amount of heartbeats per minute, or BPM. The average adult at rest has a cardiac output of 4 to 8 liters of blood per minute, with an average of 5 to 6 liters per minute. There's a few factors that affect the stroke volume. First is the preload on the heart, which is the volume of blood entering the ventricles. This is affected by the blood volume in the body, the venous blood returning to the heart, and the atrial output. Then there's the afterload on the heart, which is the resistance on blood exiting the heart to flow throughout the whole rest of the body. This blood flow is restricted by hypertension, constricted vessels, plaque, etc. The last factor on stroke volume is contractility of the heart itself, which is if there's a defect in the heart muscle, the valves, or the blood supply to the heart tissue, the heart will not be able to fully contract and will pump less blood. Now, how do we measure cardiac output? There's several methods to calculate cardiac output. Some are very invasive and some are non-invasive, but they all start with a man named Adolf Fick. In 1870, Fick presented his theory on calculating cardiac output by taking a known quantity of oxygen and dividing it by the arterial saturation minus the venous saturation percentage. The full formula that clinicians follow is cardiac output equals the amount of O2, usually 125 milliliters of O2, times the body surface area, BSA, which is height and weight, and it's all divided by arterial saturation, SaO2, minus venous saturation, SVO2, times the hemoglobin count, times a constant of 13.4. Now, <laughs> I know it all sounds complex, but a computer does this formula automatically when you input the height and weight and the hemoglobin count. And all you need to know is this is why medical devices which calculate cardiac output need those parameters in order to show their calculations. Some cardiac output measurements use Dopplers. Some use ultrasound with special probes like transesophageal probes. They measure sound reflections off the heart itself. But most common CO measurements use dye dilution method, impedance cardiography, and cardiac catheter measurements. The dye dilution method involves injecting a dye called cardiogreen into the bloodstream and blood samples to be taken at intervals to show how fast the dye reaches the extremity. There's a curve that's mapped out based on the circulation speed of the dye. The chart will go up at a specific rate to the cardiac output, then it will decrease sharply, only to go up once again a couple seconds later as the dye is now recirculating through the bloodstream again. A newer version of this method uses a photosensor on the finger probe to detect dye quantities and the speed of circulation, so there's no need to do constant blood draws. The next method of calculating cardiac output is impedance cardiography, and it has been in development since the 1960s. This is a non-invasive method which uses electrodes positioned around the thorax to measure electrical conductivity of the thorax. As blood is pumped through the heart and aorta, they change the impedance between the electrodes and create an electrical waveform. These electrical waveforms are used to calculate a variety of hemodynamic parameters. The major advantages of this method are its non-invasive technique and the ability for long-term continuous monitoring. Many companies are still developing this technology and I'm very excited to see how this changes patient monitoring in the future. 
Now for the most common method and the one method we can easily simulate on a patient simulator, thermal dilution method. The thermal dilution method is invasive as it utilizes a Swans-Gans catheter. The Swans-Gans catheter is a long tube separated usually into four chambers or lumens and at the tip of the catheter is a port for pressure readings. Then there's an integrated balloon. Next is a tiny temperature sensing thermistor bead followed by two other ports at specific distances further up the catheter. How do we use this catheter? Well, the Swans-Gans Pulmonary Arterial Catheter, or PAC, pack. It's usually inserted in the right femoral vein or into the jugular vein. Fluoroscopy or ultrasound are used to track the catheter movement through the system, and just outside the right atria, the balloon is inflated using a special syringe, this is called floating the catheter. The natural movement of blood pulls the balloon into the heart through the right atrium and through the tricuspid valve. The catheter continues until it contacts the bottom of the right ventricle. Then the balloon is pulled by the blood up through the pulmonary valve and into the pulmonary artery. The progress of the catheter can easily be monitored by the distinct waveforms sensed by the pressure sensor at the tip of the catheter. When the catheter is in position, the balloon's deflated. A fluid at a known cold temperature is injected at a specific rate into the right atrium through a port in the catheter. That cold saline is mixed with blood and warmed as it gets pumped through the right side of the heart into the pulmonary artery. There, the temperature of the mixture is measured with an embedded catheter thermistor, and the temperature is calculated by a computer which is connected to the catheter. The colder the measurement is, the higher the cardiac output, and the warmer the measurement, the slower the mixture was pumped through the heart, which means a lower cardiac output. Now this brings us full circle to why I needed to cover cardiac output with you. In order to simulate cardiac output on simulators like the Pronk SimSlim, you first need to know the flow rate of the injection and to use the temperature simulation ports on the SlimSim for the medical device to get an accurate simulated cardiac output. I know guys, this is a lot of material to cover for such a short video, but you should take a couple things away from this lesson. There's many methods for measuring and monitoring cardiac outputs. Each has their drawbacks, and this is a developing technology with incredible advancements in the last 15 years. An ECG tells you a lot about the electrical cycle of the heart, but it doesn't provide enough information on the amount of blood being pumped, the pressures of the circulatory system, or the amount of blood in the body. For a more complete picture of the circulatory system, this is why we have cardiac output. Thanks for watching this video on cardiac output. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Perhaps just enough to earn one of those thumbs up down below. Subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss any of my future videos on medical technology and I have a whole variety of them that are in production right now. Thanks again for watching.